Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast, the podcast that passes wisdom to the next generation of athletes, coaches, and parents. And in today's episode, we are interviewing Marin Walseth. Marin is a leadership coach, but also a former Division I athlete, former Division I coach. And in our conversation today, we dive into headfirst into how we can lead ourselves and then also help others lead themselves first so we can transfer that leadership onto the next generation. We also talk about boundaries and making sure that we make enough time to replenish, recharge, and keep giving and keep that giving going. And also the importance and value of a coach to ripple effect throughout our society. So without further ado, let's dive in. Hello, Marin, and welcome to the Bridging Impact Podcast. I am thrilled for our conversation today to talk about leading ourselves and transferring that leadership onto others and passing that wisdom to the next generation. So welcome to the podcast, Marin. Thank you, Justin. I'm excited to have a conversation with you and share any nuggets that I can with the listeners. Absolutely. So I hope our listeners have some notepads out and are ready to take some notes because I'm going to ask you uh, are the question that we ask all of our first guests or are all of our guests first is what is your definition of impactful leadership? Yeah, that's a good one. And it, you know, I, I had to kind of pause to think about it for, for a minute because I am a firm believer that everybody's a leader. And if you don't lead anybody else, you have to lead yourself. And so as a college basketball coach, I always wanted to play into that. Like everybody on your team is a leader in some capacity. And so you can either fight that or you can embrace their influence and make it work for your team. And so when the impactful leadership you know, term came up, I was like, well, everybody's a leader and therefore everybody can make impact. And you get to choose, like, I think of impact as like you throw a rock into the lake and then there's that ripple effect that goes out. And so we all have control over how big that ripple effect is based on how we interact. You know, like our impact is based on the depth of the relationship or the depth or the connection of a relationship or a comment or an interaction. And so to me, impactful leadership is how I interact, how I present the connections that I build with anybody and everybody. And that ripple effect is going to affect you. It's going to affect those immediately close to me that, that hear it or that feel it or that, you know, that are right there, but also who they touch and who they interact with and the conversation that they have after, and not even just today, but tomorrow and, and down the path. So, you know, impactful leadership is powerful um, because you don't know where that tsunami is going to stop, right? I love that. And I think that's part of the reason we have the Bridging Impact podcast is to pass that wisdom on to the next person. And then they pass it on to the next person. And again, it is that big ripple effect that becomes a tsunami. So I'd love to take a step back and you're a leadership coach now. So this is like your jam. This is like a, it's like a softball question for you, right? I would love to, before you got to a leadership coach, you know, you were an NTA double or division one um, college basketball player, your college ba- D1 college basketball coach, and now you're a leadership coach. I'd love for you to share a little bit of your journey to, you know, how you started to understand some of those ripple effects of leadership throughout your career. Like you said, Justin, I, I played college basketball at Penn State, had a fantastic experience academically, athletically, socially, you know, best friends, very impactful coaches. Um, so that was phenomenal. And I was fortunate enough to be able to continue playing uh, overseas and in the WNBA. Um, thank goodness I was cut. I was not going to give up, but my body was not going to hold on much longer. So <laughs> yeah. thank goodness, thank goodness I was cut um, and allowed me to get into college coaching. And, and like you said, I was a, a college basketball coach for 15 years. And I say that working at three different schools over 15 years. And so I say that in that I had a lot of interaction and a lot of impact received. I received a lot of impact from so many different coaches. 
And, you know, it's, it's cliche to say well, you learn just as much when you lose as, as you do when you win, or you learn just as much from bad coaches as you do from good coaches. And, you know, like that's, that's cliche to say, but it, for, it, it, it helps form us. And it does have that ripple effect of like, oh, heck no, I'm not doing that. Or like, wow, that was really cool. I like how I felt after that interaction or after being in that locker room or, you know, with that, with that team and on that, you know, experience. Um, and, and so I feel fortunate to have had a long career in the big picture of things, <laughs> you know, had a long career of working with coaches as peers, as the player, you know, playing for a, a coach, as the head coach working with a staff and, and seeing leadership kind of on the other side of, you don't want to be the oxygen tank for the program, but you do need to be the woman or the man with the oars keeping it going. Um, you know, so I, I, I appreciate the people that I played for and worked with that kind of prepared me for that head coach role, uh, but then also collectively stepping away from coaching women's basketball to now coaching and working with those coaches. Because as, as we talked a little bit in the open, like the runway's short, life's tough. And it's not going to get any easier at the high school level, at the you know, summer league, AU, youth levels, you know, in, in JUCO, in Division Two, in Division One, like it, it's not, we're not going to do an about face and things all of a sudden get easier, you know. We have to build the capacity to handle and to work through what's coming at us. And like I said, leadership, you have to lead yourself before you can lead anybody else. So you, we have to individually and then within groups and teams build that capacity to handle the curveball or to handle the unwelcomed feedback or to handle the criticism that goes against everything that you thought as the, you know, you thought the result was one thing and you get all this feedback that it was something different and how do you manage and handle that? But you have to lead yourself and be true to who you are to move forward and, and continue to have that positive impact on others. I think there's a lot there. And my my initial question is, will be kind of around leading ourselves, right? I, I'm a big leader, believer in leading ourselves first as well. What does that look like for coach? And it's going to look like, look different for every other coach. But like when you have a client and you're, you're working with some of these other coaches, like what are the, normally the first questions that you ask? Do, do they pertain to, you know, the basketball or the sport they're coaching? Or, or is it sometimes more personal? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And you're absolutely right. It looks very different for every single person. And I can speak for myself and for some of the coaches, not all of the coaches, but some of the coaches I work with, leading yourself to me is not perfection. It does not mean you have it all figured out. It just means you know what you want to achieve. You know how you want it to end. And, and so you operate kind of within those guardrails in hopes that, you know, you get the end result that you want. So what do those guardrails look like? What is your morning routine? What are your habits? How do you handle objections or that curveball that happens, you know, in, in your day? When somebody's late for a meeting, when a, a partner or a, a child needs something, you know, at two thirty in the afternoon. Not part that, that wasn't on the agenda, right? Like, how do you handle those, you know, those life things that happen? How are you prepared to be yourself in those, you know, less than like planned moments? Um, so habits and boundaries and preparation and, and knowing how you want to be at the end of the day, allows you to give it the best shot you can. And, and to me, that's leading yourself. I can wake up in the morning and be like, hey, let's see what's going to happen today. Or <laughs> I could wake up and be like, hey, I want to get these three things done in the business. I want to make sure to make contact with these, you know, for previous or current clients just to check in. Hey, I want to, you know, do X, Y, and Z, get my own workout in, you know, meal prep, you know, whatever that is. And now it's my habits and my discipline to start 
plug in through, but also have enough margin in my life that you get that phone call that you're like, hey, I haven't talked to you in, you know, six months. Yeah, I got 15 minutes right now. Like, absolutely. And be okay with that and not like, oh, well, here goes the day. Like, I wasn't planned. How do, how do we handle this? Yeah, the new, what you're saying is making a lot of sense to me because I struggle and I'm challenged sometimes by those moments where it's that phone call, where it's that appointment, where it's that parking ticket, whether whatever that extra curveball is in the afternoon, it could be in the morning, right? Like sometimes I, I do have a structured day and sometimes my I may be too rigid. And one thing I'm working on with myself is being a little more fluid, a little more flexible, right? Like being able to like, okay, I actually heard a really good kind of saying the other day on the Coach Forward podcast, which is another fantastic podcast with Jesse Mermies. He works for the Orlando Magic, and he talked about, and it's not something I've never thought about before, but he, the way he said it, it was like prioritize and maximize. And that's kind of what I almost hear you talking about. It's like you're prioritizing, you know, for you right now, what's on your business, for the coaches, right? Prioritize what you have to do today. Parents, all right, what do you, what do you have to do today? What are like the top three things, right? There's always four through seven, that eight or eight that we would love to do, but let's be honest, we just don't. We don't have the time for them. So how do how do you help uh, coaches or yeah, how do you help coaches like prioritize like great habits for themselves? Yeah, you brought up a great point that I was having a conversation not with a client but a, a fellow a peer in in college basketball, and and she was said, I never get to the bottom of the list, and I get so frustrated. Yeah. I'm like well, how about we just cut the list in half and feel good about attaining the list and maybe you have an extra 30 minutes somewhere at the end of the day. Like, that's not the world's worst thing, right? Like, no. but the mindset then is like, hey, I was productive, this is great. You're ready to go the next day. Um, that was a little side tangent, sorry. No. <laughs> but I think when you were talking about like maximizing and, and prioritizing something that I, that came to mind for me was setting yourself up with little quarter breaks. So I'm from the basketball world, right? You, you and I are in the basketball and we're used to halves or quarters. And how do you just insert that quarter break mid morning, that halftime break right after lunch? that break between the third and the fourth quarter sometime in the afternoon to allow yourself to reset where there's 15 minutes. It doesn't have to be long, but it's like I got off schedule or mentally I'm very flustered by like you said, the parking ticket or, or, or whatever it is. Like how do I pull myself together for the afternoon or for the evening or for practice that typically for most programs, college, high school, you know, happen in the afternoon or evening. Right. How do you allow yourself that space, that margin, that grace to like be a human, but pull yourself together so that you can maximize that next quarter, that next chunk of your day? And I think athletes can, can learn that. I think parents can learn that. Um, certainly business owners or, you know, employees, you know, can learn how to be like, hey, time out. My, uh, you know, you can even pull out your phone and put a something that's my favorite with, with with clients is hey let's go to tuesday at 3 30 you've got something to do put that in your calendar right now you're going to get an alert it's going to go off you're going to sit there stumped at what you have to do but it's going to allow you a little time 15 minutes to reset collect yourself reframe your thoughts and then be the best you can be to maximize you know whatever that next quarter of your day uh, entails I feel like that's a really interesting way of looking at it. I'm actually reading Win by uh, Daniel Pink right now, and he's talking about the importance of breaks. So I just went through those chapters, and now I have something that I can apply to it because you are making a good point. Having those scheduled, like, first end of the first quarter, end of the, end the half, right, and then a quarter, and then some days, right, you're going to have overtime. But you need to sometimes recognize when it's time to use those timeouts, right, and to reset and refresh and, you know, obviously, you don't pay that parking ticket when you get it or or whatever that may be. So with that, I'm kind of curious, how, how do you like, um, like for me, I have coworkers that are coaches and I, ha I also work with athletes. So I work with coaches and athletes. And I'm curious, like for me and myself, how can I like help, you know, pass that wisdom on and how to lead oneself without being like, hey, I know how to lead my lead myself well, so follow me, right? Like, how do I like genuinely kind of like encourage people to start nudging them to, to lead themselves a little bit more? 
more in their own like authentic ways. Yeah, that's that's an interesting it's an interesting question. And I think you hit the key word there in their own authentic way. Because right. the minute any of us are told this is what you're supposed to do, like immediately mm -hmm. there's just like heels in the ground, step on the brake, like, whoa, why? Why are you telling me something? Like, I'm an adult or I know what I'm doing. I've, I've done this too. And so there is an element of leadership needed to impress or impose that on a coworker or a young athlete of like, hey, are you happy with yourself right now? Are you like, if we look back in a year, are you going to be really happy with how you handle that situation or how you prepare for practices or how you prepare for the game? And this isn't an accusatory question. It's, it's just, hey, let's just take a step back. Are you really proud and happy? Happy probably isn't the right word. Are you proud of how you prepared for, for the game today? Are you proud of how you prepared for this meeting? If the answer is yes, great. Now, where, how can we add to that? How could, like, if that's how you prepared for this practice or this game, like, how can we take that to how you prepared to have a dinner with your grandparents or how you prepare to, you know, get ready for senior pictures or, I mean, like, any of, how can we add and make that a positive, like, snowball, right? If you're not, that's okay. Let's talk about it. Like, let's just say, well, what, what, what didn't she like? Well, I didn't like, you know, that I felt really tired. Okay, let's make an adjustment. Like, that's okay. And so I think to help them find their authentic way of leading themselves, there's got to be some evaluation. And most of us, not everybody, but most people, most athletes are kinesthetic learners and mm. like to act out or talk because there's action involved. Hence, we like sports. <laughs> um, so we can err on the side that many athletes are verbal processors. And so having conversations about like, hey, what went well? What didn't go well? How would you, what are three things that you would do differently next time? And next time might be next game or, you know, literally might not be till next year when we have tryouts, <laughs> you, you know, like, and that's okay too. But helping young people or, or peers, coworkers, like evaluate how they feel how proud are they of how they showed up and the end result, I believe, allows for you to model leadership and allows the authenticity to be like, you don't have to do it the way I do it, but let's talk about what works for you so that they have some ownership in the process. Yeah, ownership's a big thing that honestly, I feel like almost every guest I bring on talks about ownership because I feel like in the past, we haven't always thought about coaching in a way of like asking questions, which is the coaching habit, which is on your reading list that I see in the back that I know like changed my life when I was working with first graders, <laughs> like uh, just always asking questions. And that's what we were talking about. You kept being like, are you proud? Not saying I am proud of you for this. Like, I feel like being able to help people learn and, and they have to start, I don't want to say the word critically think, but they have to start, you know, verbalizing what is important to them. What makes them proud? What do they need to keep working on? Because that's leading themselves. Otherwise, it's coach telling me what to think, what to do, right? And that's, you don't have that ownership over yourself. So with that, I'm, I'm curious, you know, how has that, I mean, obviously that book, but also like asking questions really helped you become a better coach. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, <laughs> I, I, I just chuckle a little bit because when I took over the program that I, that I took over, I was new, right? And mm -hmm. I would ask questions because that's just who I am. Like, why yeah. did you make that pass? What were you thinking right. when you called that play? And every kid was like, whoa, like, why is she asking me? Mm -hmm. Because so many coaches 
this is what we do. This is how you go. Like they just tell, tell, tell. And I think in sport that turns out to be playing like a robot. And I believe that, I mean, again, you and I are basketball folks, but the more you play, you see angles, you see, and you feel spacing. And there's just things that when a, when some, when a coach says, Hey, why did you throw that pass? Well, it felt like the right pass to throw, which is the absolute right answer. And, and so, because they figured it out themselves. And so when asking the, the players that I, I coached, um, but also my, my clients now, why, why did you respond that way? Why did you say that? Again, it's coming purely from a curiosity place. I am just genuinely, I want to begin to think, see and understand how you make decisions, your thought process, so that I can adapt to you, you can meet me, and, and this can be a good thing. But I, I, I do think, uh, from my experience, that first probably almost a year, because you go through, you know, like when I were in games and she's asking me these questions again, oh my God, what's the right answer? <laughs> No, 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 there's no right or wrong answer, only what you're experiencing and feeling. Mm. And I think that helps the ownership. I think that helps re retention. I think that helps confidence. I mean, at the end of the day, whether it's high school athletics or college athletics, you want them to be better people when they leave your program. And, and part of that is ready for that next step. After they're done with high school, you want them to be ready to go onto a college campus or, or go into another learning environment with confidence. It's your responsibility as a high school coach to help them get there. As a college basketball coach, my responsibility was for them to be prepared to walk into an interview when they left. And like, how, how do you do that? You have to get them to have confidence in their own voice, to think critically, to be a leader of themselves so that they have perspective, they have thoughts, they have ideas that then make them attractive for a job or you know, for whatever their, maybe it's a grad school application or a med school application or you know, whatever that next step is. Um, and so the question asking purely from curiosity, not from judgment, and, and that's a fine line that if you don't know, as, as the speaker, if you don't know, or you have any feelings it comes out. And so like that's that's a challenge for the speaker to you know continue with hey, I'm just curious why you made that play or why you made that call or 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 why you sat at the end of the bench or or whatnot. So that there can be dialogue and teaching for them to grow as as the young people that they are. Right. And I'm I'm totally like just resonating with what you're saying, because when I ask, especially older groups questions, sometimes the younger ones, they're, they're just like, they're so young, they're, they're happy to answer, right? But when I ask the older kids questions, they look at me sideways, like, you're supposed to be lecturing at me, why are you asking me questions? And it's like, because I'm curious, I'm, what did you get better at today? What was your favorite part of the day? You know, what it, exactly what, you, what you're talking about, what did you see there? Right. And, and I like, I swear they have like five eyes when I ask them those questions. So I'm curious, like, did, did you get pushback that first year when you started asking questions? And if you did, like, how did you, how did you come across? And, and I feel like it's probably the answer is probably a little bit of just like time and like getting to know you a little bit more and like trust you. But like, how did you navigate that pushback if there was any? Yeah, I think, you know, each kid was a little bit different. Um, right. I don't feel that I got straight up pushback, like, hey, I don't want to answer you, but I got the yeah. like, the quizzical, like, is there an ulterior mm -hmm. motive here? Why is she really right. asking me? I'm uncomfortable. Yeah. What's the right answer? And, and so being very firm with how I wanted to lead our program, I just kept asking questions. I kept reassuring them that there was no right or wrong answer. I'm just curious. If you want to write it down and give it to me, if you want to text me later, like, you know, however you want to communicate your thoughts, again, there's no right or wrong. I'm just curious. And, and so it was consistent. It would have been very easy for me to be like, oh, I'm getting resistance. Like, this isn't for these kids. I'll wait till all the kids are here that I've recruited or, or you know, whatever. But that's, that's, that's silly. Then those other kids are, are missing out on learning opportunity. Um, but I think the other side of that is also building 
relationships off the court so that they see you as a mentor, as a person, as somebody who, you know, has flaws and, you know, well, whatever, you know, maybe she can't cook. Maybe she doesn't know how to dance. Maybe, you know, like, but also like, yeah, we can talk about that Netflix show or we, you know, I mean, there's just other commonalities that they begin to see you as more than just their basketball coach or their sport coach. And now it's like, oh, they almost like fall into it without meaning to because you, the title is, you know, taken down a little bit or they see you with a different, you know, set of lenses of like, oh, that's really not, she's really not because they're changing. You haven't changed. They're, they're changing. Their ears are changing. Their mindset is changing and being, you know, more accepting or, or more, um, more willing to be a little bit uncomfortable because there's a trust factor that you're continuing to build. Right. And in actually the last episode, Mr. B or coach B is what he goes by. He was telling me how, you know, that when, when he's off the court and he's always asking them questions, he's Andy when he's off the court, he's asking them questions. Mm. And it's just like that personal connection. It's just like kind of, he's talking about kind of almost putting down the mask and taking off kind of the title that you're talking about, just being a human with them and mm. building those relationships. Cause that's that trust that is required to, you know, the, then teach those life lessons and, and probably those, those challenging moments where you have to hold, you know, a player accountable so you can therefore prepare them for post post basketball, post football, post, post whatever sport it is, because the best players in the world don't play forever. They don't even Michael Jordan, Michael Jordan's retired. Like everyone's retired. Everyone does something after sports. Like father, father time always wins. You can't play forever. Right. Yeah. So I think those, those life skills are so important. I agree. I, I, I agree. And, and as a basketball coach, I always thought my, I am choosing basketball as the platform, but my responsibility is to prepare these young women for whatever's next. You know, someone on to another degree, someone into the workforce, some got married and had kids right away. You know, I mean, whatever that role or whatever that responsibility is, someone in the military, you know, it's like, hey, I got to help them get them prepared. And the fun part was I have no idea where they're going <laughs> or what they're doing. And at any given year, you've got, you know, 16 different, 12 different potentials. So it's like, hey, I got to cast a wide net and make sure they are are prepared for any number of things, not just everybody goes to grad school or everybody joins the workforce or everybody plays overseas or, you know, which I think right, as always... leaders, like keeps us on our toes and keeps us always learning and, and perfecting ourselves as well. And it's the fun part because I, I, I'm curious, like how cool is it to see, you know, now that you've, you've coached for 15 years in the college world, you probably have quite a few students that have graduated. How cool is it to see like your, your athletes and players grow and, and go on and go out into the world to do their thing. I think it's fantastic, you know, and they were all different individuals and different athletes and different people when they were on the teams I was a part of. And they're still, you know, very individual, but yeah, you know, I mean, there's a kid that's still playing overseas that I would have never in a million years thought would last more than a season, you know, and, and she's thriving. She's having a great time. You know, I was just back this spring at a, at a wedding of a, of a player who just graduated a couple of years ago and she's a school teacher and, you know, loves it. And, you know, I mean, it's neat seeing players continuing to live out their passions, you know, with whatever that, whatever that is. Yeah, I know. I love that. And I think my next question will be around, like, it, it requires a lot of effort and energy and, and attention to, you know, invest into these athletes and in our players and our teams and in our last conversation, in the last podcast conversation, we talked a little bit about balance and you talked a little bit about boundaries earlier in the podcast. I'm curious, you know, how you have probably learned from your experience around, you know, kind of setting boundaries between, because I clearly you're a coach that's curious and you care. And sometimes, you know, those conversations outside of practice, right, where you're talking, where you're just Marin or you're just coach or you're just Justin, you're not even coach, right? They, they sometimes expand, but you want to make sure you make time for the people that are closest to you, of course, and honestly, making time for yourself. So how do you set those boundaries? Yeah. 
I think boundaries sometimes comes with like a negative connotation, like they're harsh and they're bad. And if I set a boundary, like people aren't going to like me because like, that's a no, no. Um, when in reality, when you learn the skill of boundary setting, you are so much more free and, and you have so much more margin in your life and your emotional tank is much higher. Um, I also think that people think boundaries have to be like set in stone forever, where you can have boundaries around certain aspects of your life, finances, nutrition, exercise, family time. You know, I mean, like you can have boundaries around anything. Your boundaries can always change. <laughs> if they're not working, reestablish them. Um, so, so I think setting boundaries and aiming for something that's just a little bit harsher than you want is always the way to go. And you can always pull it back a little bit, but once you establish it, it's really hard to be like, no, actually, that, that, happened, that, that boundary goes to Sunday too. And people are like, what? You know, where it's like, just put it to Sunday and you can always move it back to Saturday once you get comfortable. But I think maybe the more important thing to talk about, because you started that question with coaches give so much. How do they fill their tank? And that is something that I talk about with all of my clients all the time. When's your next vacation? It doesn't have to be 10 days. It can be three hours. When's the next time you're doing something just for you? Where's your energy level? How's that going to get filled? What do you, you know, how are you going to unplug? How are you going to recharge? Um, and that's like a mindset because in competitive athletics, it's almost like a thing of pride. If we work really hard and we're super tired, that means like we gave it our, like we're strong and we gave it our best effort. And this is our reward being fatigued. Really? Is that, I mean, there's some truth to that but is that how you want to live your life so talking with clients or talking with with athletes or parents like thinking about the longevity there needs to be self-care some people think that's a fluffy word and that means that the ladies go to the spa and get their toenails painted if that's what you want to believe go right ahead and believe it but i will tell you that my self-care includes massages, sitting outside and reading, turning off my phone, sleeping in one day on a Saturday, like once a Saturday, like once a month, just deciding like this is gonna happen to fill my cup so that I can be available for my clients, like in my, in my life now, for my clients when they need me. In a coach's world, that's gonna look different in season, out of season, game day, practice. You know, as a as a basketball coach, like game days, those were like the best days. There wasn't a ton of prep left. Like you might want to review some things, but there wasn't a ton of prep left. Kids didn't have to get taped and all that three, you know, early in the day. Like they showed up for the game. You had a, a walkthrough and whatnot. But your morning, my mornings at least, I set them up to be very free. I got my own workout in. I did a few things around the house. Maybe I ran a couple errands. Certainly got to, the, got to the office by noon or, you know, like early in the day to get things accomplished. But it wasn't this like, it's game day. I got to get, no, it's game day. It's game mm. day. Like, let's enjoy the game and let's recharge myself in the process. And so, again, that, I think that looks different for everybody. It's going to look different even year to year for the same person. It's certainly, you know, like my, my self-care and my margin, day one, we, year one of taking over a division one basketball program. I know I didn't start watching film until I got home at night. Mm -hmm. You know, because there was like decisions that needed to be made, people that needed to be met, relationships that need to be called, uh, fostered. Absolutely. Did it all willingly. And then there was like a switch in like year three that I was like, am I watching film during the day? This is weird. You know, I had just gotten better at parts of my job mm. and I was able to, you know, pour into myself and, and recharge myself differently in that part of my career. 
So it's different from person to person. It's different in season out. It's different from year to year, but it's so needed. I can't tell, I can't emphasize to my clients enough. Even just people I see out, you know, when I go to recruiting events or, you know, I'm on a college campus, I'm like, hey, what, what do you, when, when are you going to, when are you going to get on vacation? Oh, well, there's a recruiting shutdown. You know, it's, it's in August. Yeah, it's June. When are you going to take a day? When are you going to take half a day for yourself? You live in Washington, D.C. When are you going to go to a concert? When are you going to go to an p- outdoor park? When are you going to go see a sporting event? Like, when are you going to do something that you're not coach and you're able to just be yourself? I think there's a lot of wisdom there that ties into kind of what we were talking about earlier with breaks and in between quarters, right? That's like kind of like the maintenance breaks. But I feel like what you're talking about here right now is that when the game is over or on practice days or on your days off, how are you recharging? You know, for me, it, it, you're right. It does look different. Like when I lived in Eugene, Oregon and was surrounded by, you know, rivers and trees, like it looked different. You know, there's a lot more nature there between now I'm in Los Angeles, like a big metropolitan city, it takes a little bit longer to do some of the things that I used to like doing. So I've had to adjust kind of my, my, you know, I guess my, my self-care routine. And with that, it's also like, I've been really trying to be better. Actually, I've, I've gotten worse, but I want to start getting better at the phone. The phone is like, I'm really trying to, trying to go, like I just moved to a little safer neighborhood in LA. So Bless up on that and trying to take walks where I, I don't have a phone. And it's just like, it's been very, very like freeing for me. I think, you know, for me and honestly, a lot of people, and, and I honestly, I feel like for athletes, and this is hopefully what I'm going to bring, because I, I didn't mention this to you before, but I'm going to be coaching the Venice Frost Off boys basketball team. And so, you know, I feel like obviously I'm, I'm all of us honestly are so glued to our phones that like taking phone breaks is just are super necessary. And for, I, I'm a content creator. So like, to me, sometimes my brain sig- like seeing my phone signals work, right? So it's unplugging, whether it's coaching, whether it's, you know, your content creator, I kind of digress there, but, um, you know, just, just the value of taking breaks is so important for us to continue to give and serve at a high level. Absolutely, because that's what started this whole this whole part of the conversation, right? Was how do we as leaders who give, give, give our time and our emotions and our energy, how do we, one of my favorite terms is, how do you budget your energy? People are like, huh? I budget my finances. Mm. Like, yeah, but you need to budget your energy as well. Because you can't burn it all out on one kid. You can't burn it all out on the first three days of the week. You know, how do you budget your emotions and your energy? That's a, that's a really good point. And like, I, the, the last thing I'll say about this is I did, I had a conversation with someone that talked about, obviously we know the filling of the cup, right? But there's only so many cups we can fill into, right? Like we have to have our priorities, right? So if I have a cup and it's full, I filled it up, but I, I'm like pouring it a lot here and a lot here and a lot here. And then, it's empty, right? So I have to like, then I have to re report in the cup or there's people are just going to be getting little drips, you know, and when I'm at practice, I'm just going to, I'm going to be super tired. So just trying, I, I really like the budgeting energy mm-hmm. and like, you know, making sure that there's enough water or whichever kind of like metaphor kind of sticks with people mm-hmm. for, to get them to like serve and protect their time. Because at the end of the day, I'm curious, you know, for you, like, why, why do you coach and, and what do you think is the most, what is he, what is a coach to you? I'm going to take the definition that I heard from Lindsay Wilson, who's a mindset coach with positive performance. She's a, a former division one basketball player at Iowa state and played professionally overseas and, and just somebody from the entrepreneurial world and the coaching world that I, I really enjoy and I, I look up to. And she said, a coach is a benefit and it's a guide and a Sherpa. Why would you not want one? Right. Like you want to get better at playing basketball. You're going to join a team because there's a coach who's going to mm. help you. You could go to the Y and just like goof around or you could join a team or try out for a team because you believe that team, the program, the culture, the coach, led by the coach, is going to help you. 
And so whether you're hiring a nutritionist, a nutrition coach or a fitness coach, because, you know, you want to be better in the weight room or, you know, improve your cardiovascular, whatever that looks like for you, or a leadership coach or an executive coach or a life coach or a business coach. You know, I mean, I, I run a business. I'm a business coach. Like, if you, yes, if you will help me run my business, sign me up. <laughs> you know, like, I will, yes, I don't know. Ever, I was a basketball player and a basketball coach. I don't know how to run a business, but I will work with somebody because I value that. I want to get better at it. And so I think some people think there's something has to be wrong to hire a coach or to work with a coach mm. where if that's what you believe, fine. But I'd like to challenge you. Nothing has to be wrong. Like what if you're operating at like a nine, but you want to operate at 10, you deserve to operate at a 10 working with, again, a finance coach, a business coach, a leadership coach, a life coach to help you get to what you can be. I call that being an active participant in your own life. And that has been my mantra and my motto for as long as like, well, since college. But, you know, whether I'm working with my student athletes when I was a basketball coach or just joking around with like my friends or my family or, or working with my clients, it's like you can complain about it. You can wish it was different or you can be an active participant in your own life and make a decision to make a change. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's where, like, when the thought is be an active participant in your own life, hire a coach. Go ask for help. Go out and start walking. Then maybe you'll start running. Then maybe you'll, you know, you'll get in the fit, to the fitness shape, the fitness level that, that you aspire to. Or be an active participant in your own life. You don't like sitting at the end of the bench? What are you going to do about it? You know, like, get with the JV coach. Get with the high school coach. Ask how you can get better. Spend time in the waiting room. Be out in your driveway. You, you know, whatever that looks like. But be an active participant in your own life. And there are so many people wanting to help others. Wanting to help high school kids, college kids, adults, parents. I mean, there are so many people wanting to share their expertise, share their struggles, so that you don't have to go through it the exact same way. And I love that for being a coach, right? Both of us are coaches in our own different worlds, right? But that's that ripple effect that you were talking about at the very beginning, because when you have a coach, whether it's a fitness coach, a business coach, a life coach, a basketball coach, they help you improve at the skills that you want to go to, right? They're that guy. And I feel like one of the things I heard you talking about, and I was thinking about like for previous coaches, you know, cause I, I'm always trying to you know, imagine and picture and, and put places. It's like, I feel like I've had so many great coaches that have helped me. And honestly, my parents, I, I'm going to lump them in as coaches and my grandparents, because I feel like they're the ultimate coaches because they have so much influence on you that they have done such a good job coaching me that I understand, you know, what I need to do to get better. Let's, let's say for me as a basketball player, when they're not around, right? Because I had so many good coaches and now I really know what I need to do and I'm, I'm self-disciplined and I learned that from those other great coaches that teach me about pushing yourself. Don't be in your comfort zone. And I think that's that kind of ripple effect that a coach can have. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I loved what you said about parents being the ultimate coach. You know, like I find myself when, when speaking or when content creating, like, like you said, I do a lot of that as well. Like, yeah, I can be talking to a coach in relation to how they interact with their team but mom, dad, how are you interacting with your little teammates? <laughs> you know, those little people that, that operate in, in your household that may or may not have siblings. How are, how are they being good teammates? How are they improving their skills? How are they, how are you building trust with them? You know, like, so it, I did not think of parents as coaches until I stepped into this role. As a as a leadership coach, then you know now I'm seeing it more and more of like, while you're leading your team, you can lead that team at home just the same. Right. Yeah. And and that's goes back to your very first point of we are all leaders. 
So with that being said, as our conversation is nearing the end, what is your final piece of, of advice for coaches and where can coaches connect with you and find your resources? Cause she's got some great reading lists that I am going to selfishly go look at and, and add some things to the cart. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, first of all, my, my website is my name, marinwalsa.com. Um, that's what I am on social media as well. So very easy to find me there. Um, but I would just leave, leave our listeners with the idea that leadership is always a journey and we are all always a work in progress. Um, I, I think that can be a barrier for some, like, well, I don't want to be a leader because I don't think I'll ever get it. No, you'll always get it because you're always leading yourself. And I, I firmly believe that people want to improve, people want to get better, people want to meet expectations. And so when you step into a leadership role and believe that you can lead yourself to your goals, to something better, to something bigger, that snowball starts that ripple effect. And then, you know, like any habit that we have, it, it starts and you're like, oh, I want to do this again. I want to get better. Like you get that endorphin ru rush of like, oh, hey, this feels pretty cool. Like I I'm liking where I'm going, um, but it starts with yourself. It all begins with yourself and then you're able to transfer it others to others and pass it to the next generation. Marin, I thank you so much for your time today. You were a wonderful guest. Again, I got so many notes right here that I'm going to start applying to my own life and with my athletes and coaches as well. Thank you, Justin. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Bridging Impact Podcast. We'd love it if you would like, subscribe, leave a comment, and a review on whatever platform you're on. It's the best way to help us grow. We appreciate you for doing that. We'll shout you out on social media. I'd also love if you connected with me on social media. Let me know your thoughts, and this is why I do it. I want to share knowledge and wisdom from experienced leaders to people like yourself and myself so we can have this dialogue and move forward make an impact on the world so stay tuned stay subscribed cheers <laughs>